welcome back again for the people who've joined us for the third time in a row for our four myth busting sessions. For new people that have joined us, this is a series of four myth busting sessions that we have been doing. This is the third in our series. Today we will be myth busting on the role of the change manager. We have already done the role of the business analyst and the role of the facilitator. And so today we're going to look at the role of the change manager. And what does that look like? What are some of the myths and truths about it? For anyone that did miss any of the previous ones, either on facilitation or on business analysis, feel free to look it up in our YouTube channel on DDLS, and you will find a lot of our webinars there as well. So you'll be able to go back, take a look at the myth busting sessions on both business analysts and facilitation, along with all of our other webinars that we have done over the last few months. This is going to be an interactive seminar. And what this means with the interactive webinar is that you guys will be clicking things along as we go. You will see this, uh, if you have full screen on your left hand side, you will see a polling panel that will pop up when I do open the polls. For people who have a full screen for your experience, you will have to find it in the polling section at the top. So you will need to go to a little top part which will have a polling, press on there, and then you'll get your options to select whether you think it's a myth or whether you think it's a truth. I am going to leave it to you guys. I will be sharing some stats as well as to everyone that has dialed in today. So we are going to be looking at what you guys all think and make sure it's as interactive as possible. So we are here today to talk about the role of the change manager and where we're going to get all this information from, but other than our CMI. So many of you would have heard of the Change Management Institute. It is a professional body put together for change. And they've come internationally with all these people who know change and they've come together to say, hey, what does change look like in the industry? And what is change? Why are we even bothering with change? What is change all about? We've got all these box, body of knowledge. We've got the bad box, the pin box, and we've also actually got a sim box. Bad box being your business analyst body of knowledge. Then we've got our pin box, our project management body of knowledge. Now we've got our sim box as well, a change management body of knowledge. In front of you, you'll see that book being the effective change manager. This is the SIMBOC. What we will be talking about today is everything aligned to the SIMBOC. It's aligned to the internationally recognized body of knowledge. It's aligned to what the CMI would have put out. And we are going to be talking from a change from that perspective. So it can be organizational change. It can be day-to-day -day change. It can be changed just for your project, depending on what level of the organization you're working in and where you are. But change is quite relevant to everybody even on a personal level. You deal with change on a day-to-day -day basis in the sense that we're constantly going through change and with this new era of technology, we go through a change a lot more than we used to and we're frequently in the face of change. So how are we handling change? What does change mean? So we're going to go through some of that today. The first myth that we're going to start talking about is there is a massive there is a mathematical formula to change. What I am going to do is I will be putting 15 seconds up on the clock and I will be pushing this poll out to you guys. You will be able to choose between either this being a myth or whether you think that this is a truth. So we will be doing this for a number of myths and truths. So again, I'm opening the poll out to you guys. You should be able to get access to that. The first one we've got on the table right now we're talking about, there is a mathematical formula to change. Whether you guys think that this is a myth or whether you guys think that this is a truth. There is a mathematical formula to change. So change can actually be calculated with a formula. Is there a mathematical formula to change? So I'm just seeing the polling results still getting pushed through and coming through to us now. I'm going to push some results up to you guys as we generate that. So the sentence again was, there is a mathematical formula to change. Okay, so we're looking at whether there is actually a mathematical formula to change. Is change really that scientific? Is it that black and white? Can we actually then determine should we change or should we not change? So just pushing the results out to everybody so you can all see what you've come up with. I can see a percentage of you have gone. We've got a 31 out of the 60, so about half of you have said that this is a myth. And then there's about 27% of you guys saying that this is a truth and some of you have stayed on the fence. This is, a matter of fact, a truth. There is actually a mathematical formula to how you would calculate change. And were you, some of you would have heard of this mathematical formula being the Beckett and Harris change formula. This change formula states that C equals to A, B, D, and the sum of that is greater than the cost and it usually is the perceived cost. So what we talk about here is for the perceived cost, 
If A, B and D is not greater than the perceived cost, you're not ready to change. So let's take a look at what A, B and D looks like. A says the level of dissatisfaction with the status quo. So for someone to want to change, they've got to be really dissatisfied with the status quo. So I constantly use this formula with my grandparents. My grandparents, they love to step into a bank and they want to stay, they actually get this little passbook and they go up to the teller and get it printed. So I've been time and time again trying to have a conversation with them about going, you know what, maybe it's time to go to online banking. Maybe it's time that you don't actually have to physically go into a branch every fortnight and get your little passbook printed and actually get charged $5 a pop for it. So what happens there is for me to actually make sure that they change, A is the level of dissatisfaction with the status quo. I need to create this burning platform. I need to create these reasons as to why they need to change. So they have to be so unhappy with stepping into the bank and talking to someone at the teller. So I have to talk to them about the fact that one, it's $5 per pop. So every time they go into the bank, it's going to cost them $5. They feel a lot more dissatisfied by the fact that it's the banks that are now charging them for that passbook. The next one is then the time. Someone needs to be able to see them, drive them, drop them off, the inconvenience of that. So talking to them about the fact that that status quo, going into a bank and stamping it into a little passbook, that level of dissatisfaction needs to be significantly high. The next one is the desirability of the proposed change. The proposed change to my grandparents being the online banking needs to be easy enough for them. They need to be able to just see how they could on their tablet, if they're already using their tablets, or on their computers, how it is easy for them to replace the person that is in the teller and stamping a book, how the desirability of the proposed change seems to be a lot easier than that expected. So you need to actually give them the ease and that desire to go into that new world. So what happens here is that they then, I have to show them, that they get an update on the spot. They get to see it not having to wait two weeks. They can see it instantaneously, today, tomorrow, the day after, on an as-needs basis. So there has to be a desire for that change to occur. The last part is that practicality of the change. How easy is it for them to have that ease? Okay, so that practicality of the change. Right now, if my grandparents had no one to support them, if none of the grandkids want to support them, if they had no internet, then there's no practicality to the change. They might as well just continue going into the bank and stepping into there and going to the teller. What we're trying to say here has to also be practical for the change. Do they already have internet? Do they have everything available to them? Will they have the significant amount of training? Do they have the support that is needed? So it has to have all of those factors, A, B, and D, and the sum of that needs to be greater than the perceived cost. Okay, so in their minds, there will be perceived cost, the cost of travel to the bank versus the cost of internet. So then you have to understand the cost of the ongoing internet needs to be smaller than what they deem as the change, the A, the B, and the D. So Beckett and Harris has come up with, you can only change, and people will only change if your A, B, and D, the sum of that is greater than the perceived cost. The next one we're about to do, and again, I'm going to push a poll out to you guys, is the change manager is only needed for large projects. So I'll open that up to the floor. The change manager is only needed on large projects. So again, here I'm looking for whether you guys think that this is a myth or whether you guys think that this is a truth. The change manager is only needed on large projects. So again, a few more seconds on the clock just to let everybody put in their truth or myth. The change manager is only needed on large projects. Usually quite a controversial one. Many organizations I've worked for, and I've worked for many organizations along the past, they often used to tell me, hey, Louisa, we have a large project, therefore we need a project manager. On the small ones, perhaps the project manager can wear that hat, or the business analyst can wear that hat, or another role could wear that hat. What have you guys said? Let's take a look at the results. Do you guys think that this is a truth or a myth? The change managers only needed on large projects. According to you guys, a strong 70% of you have said that this is a myth, that the change managers only needed on a large project. 70% of you have said that this is a myth. 1% have said it's a truth. I will tell you that this is a, as you guys know, a myth. Okay. Change manager is needed, and sometimes you might tell me, Louisa, we might need to actually have the same person who is either our project manager, our business analyst, or somebody else that might need to actually be 
putting on that hat. Yes, that's fine. You are able to wear multiple hats, but you need to take on the responsibilities of the change manager. Every project that you do in your organization, projects will always bring on change. So your project needs to ensure that there is the change components included. Every project brings on change, and that's why you're doing a project, because you want to get from point A to point B, and that includes some sort of change. Even your daily life, in your constant workplace, things are changing. Even for leaders, they've got to wear that hat as a change manager. It's got to understand that we're not just saying that change management as a title. It's not just a job title. It's the fact that there are responsibilities taken on. So if you are a people manager, if you're a person that actually looks after a lot of staff in your organization, your organization is constantly changing. You actually have to wear the hat of the change manager. How do you handle change? What does change look like? What does communications look like? Do I need to consider some sort of training for people? How am I going to make sure that people actually go on the change curve and actually learn the new things compared to where the old ways are? How do they pick up the new ways? So it's about how will we actually transition. So the change manager is needed irrespective of the size of the project and irrespective of what type of organization you are. Every time that there is change, and especially with projects, every project bring on change, you need to consider having a change manager as part of that. The next one talks about is a project manager the same as a change manager? Is the project manager and the change manager the same thing? So again, I'm pushing a poll out to you guys. Is the project manager and change manager the same thing? Considering many organizations do make these two people wear the same hats, is a project manager and a change manager the same thing? So I can see that people are still coming on. Okay, so the question here, the statement was, is a change manager and a project manager the same thing? So we've seen many organizations, sometimes we are asked to do that with multiple hats, wear multiple responsibilities. Are we saying the same thing? Just because you're a project manager and you run projects and projects bring on change, yes, does that naturally make you a change manager? Showing you guys some of the results that have come through. What we've got is a strong 69% of you have said that this is a myth with a 3% of you saying that this is a truth, you are all quite correct that this is a myth. I do have a quick table here, and this table is from the SIMBOC, from the Change Management Body of Knowledge, and it actually has shows that a hat that you wear as a project manager is quite conflicting to a person that wears a change management hat. So the project manager's purpose, the main primary purpose, is that the project is executed to time with agreed resources and on budget. The key responsibilities that they've got there is about the defining the scope, planning and identifying the resources, task scheduling, identifying and allocating the resources, managing and tracking tasks, resolving problems and issues, project delivery and wrap up. It's very much the project base. Okay, it's about how do we actually deliver that project on time? How are we going to deliver the current resources we've got? And how do we do it to the budget that we have? That's what the project manager is focused on. So if they're only looking at those certain budget times, okay, then at our change manager, putting on the change manager's hat, what is their primary purpose as the change manager? It says here to ensure stakeholder and business expectations are met. So you don't focus on how much it's going to cost. You don't work within those constraints. You want to ensure that your stakeholders in your business can actually change and understand what that change is. Your key responsibilities is your external project communications, your stakeholder management, your change readiness, your change impact, your capability development, your training needs, your business engagement and transitions as well as sustaining change. Change manager focuses primarily on the people side, and you're wanting to see how everybody would be dealing with that change. So how are they actually accepting the change? What is the impact of that change? How do they get to learn that new change that's coming up? How are the stakeholders getting managed? This will actually take a lot longer, takes a lot more time. It could cost you more than you actually think. 
Often I've seen projects and projects and time and time again where the change manager is only brought on right at the end of the project. They believe that this is just that little component at the end where it's a training component and you go tick and we send some comms out, which is usually via email, tick, and they say that that is change being handled. But what you forget is that the change manager should start from the beginning of the project as well. Because you, to do change successfully, you actually need as much time as possible, as much time to be able to, able to help and deal with all the changes progressively. So how are people going to, along the way, get the communications? How do they get the comms along the way? How do they know that these are the changes that's happening? How can they provide you feedback as they go? How will they come on that journey of change with you? And then change manager focus on all that. It doesn't have the primary focus of, if we have to deliver by that date, and what does that date look like as per what a project manager would have to do. So there are some different responsibilities between our project manager and our change manager. Not to say that one individual couldn't do both. When you're wearing the multiple hats, you just need to know which hat you're wearing at what times. When are you being the project manager and when are you being the change manager? Where it is a larger project, by all means, you might have to have the split roles. And where it is a smaller project, and you might say to me, Louisa, we don't have that luxury. We need to combine the two to one person. Now that's fine, but just do not neglect how much comms you should be doing from the beginning, how much change you need to consider, how much stakeholder engagement you need to have, and all those plannings and strategies right from the beginning that a change manager would need to look at. The next thing for a change manager to consider is does everyone learn the same way? So the next statement we've got, the fourth one we've got there, again, I'm pushing it out to you guys. Everyone learns the same way, whether you believe that this is a myth or whether you think this is a truth. Everyone learns the same way. So do you all think that as a change manager, we only need to consider that everybody's going to learn one way, and that's usually why we have one type of training, and we then go training event at the end of a project, tick, and training is done. Okay. So here again, the statement is, everyone learns the same way. So do you guys all think that we learn the same way? So is this a myth, or is this a truth to you guys? Everyone learns the same way. Okay, I can see the results still coming through. It's getting a bigger bunch of you. I can see a few more have dialed in as we've gone. And pushing the results out to you guys. This is even stronger than before. You have a 74% of you saying that this is a myth and only a 1% saying that this is a truth. This is a definite myth. We do all learn slightly differently and these are the all different learning styles I'm going to go through. The first part I'm going to talk with you guys is what we call the learning cycle. Every time you learn something new, you go through a learning cycle. And we start with the learning cycle at our concrete experience. Picture yourselves back in the days, very long time ago, it could be for some people or recent for others, is learning a bicycle, how to ride a bicycle. Let's say back at the very beginning when you're learning to ride a bicycle, something would have happened, otherwise concrete experience. So you would have seen either your parents ride a bicycle, somebody else on the street ride the bicycle, your neighbor riding a bicycle, your sibling riding a bicycle. Something's happened, you've seen it, and that's built on concrete experience. Other people have done it before, and other people who are also able to ride bicycles, you would have seen that happen. That's your concrete experience that you're going to see it from. That's the first type of learning that you've got. As you're cycling through the learning loop, the next part that you've got is a reflective observation. What you usually do after you've seen something happen, so yes, you've seen someone ride a bicycle, parents, siblings, neighbours, you've seen them ride it and you've seen them do it time and time again. You actually reflect on a bit. You think about it to your own perspective. You actually then reflect how they're doing this on two wheels, how they're actually able to balance on two, how they're lifting one arm up to indicate, how they're actually moving. Are they just doing their upper bodies? Is it just their back their legs? You reflect on that. So people who then just observe, you're watching people and you reflect on that. Moving through the cycle, you get to what we call abstract conceptualization. You come up with your own theories. That's what this part really is talking about. You come up with a theory as to how they're balancing. You might not look for the scientific approach or whatnot. It's about your own putting your patterns together. You notice it's left leg, then right leg, then left leg, then right leg. Then your foot goes down or your balance needs to go up. Everybody has a different way of interpreting it. So now you're interpreting that information. And the last part of the learning cycle is that there is practical experimentation. What happens here is that you then get on a bicycle yourself and try it. You get your hands dirty. 
And what we're trying to say here is every single time you go through learnings, you'll always go through that cycle. You go through the learning cycle. You always start with some sort of concrete experience. Something has happened. So you could be learning a whole new application. You might be an, an organization that's rolling out Office 365, and you would have seen other organizations already using Office 365, or you would have already seen it being used quite well. So that something has happened. So moving from that, you then reflect on some of those features, then you put into your own ideas of this is how you're going to use Office 365 and this is what's going on, what it means, and then you get yourself hands dirty and you actually put it into practice. So you then keep cycling through that. What they say here, if you were taking it to the next level, is if you have a preference, where your preference lie in one of those. So out of the learning cycle, you would actually have one that is your preference. And your preference is usually your learning style. So what we're saying here is, personally for me, I'm quite the practical experimentation person. I like to, to get my hands dirty. That's where my preference is in the learning loop. As the others is all just as important. But what happens is we all have a preference. There is one area in this learning cycle that you would prefer and that is becomes your preference. So I'm one of those people who I would probably never read a manual for the life of me and you give me an application and I'll click around, I'll be happy to click around and break it even and that's my learning styles. But there'll be other people who will actually read through the manual first and really reflect on it and understand how it works. Or there are other people with a learning style, concrete experience, that they want to see others do it first. So they want to see if someone demoing it to them. So you've got the different types of learning styles because of your preferences in your learning cycle. And so as a change manager, whenever you're deciding on what type of training might they need for going from point A to point B, the type of change that you're providing in your organization, you need to decide on a learning styles that works for everybody. So in a classroom base, you need to have someone that is at the front of the classroom, mostly instructor-led, that actually has that concrete experience that can talk about how it works. Then you need to give them the ability to be able to reflect. In other words, give them the courseware so that it is written for the people who need to be able to read and observe and go through it themselves. Then for the people who actually want to go hands on, have the computers in the room that is going to allow them to do the click, 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 click and to trial and to get their hands dirty. And for people who need abstract conceptualization, pen, paper, let them come up with their own theories, let them talk to you about their theories and to do role plays and trial those type of things. So the idea is you want to have a mix of the learning. Since we all do learn differently, there are preferences into our learning styles. So we are needing to, as a change manager, understand understanding all of those learning styles. Okay, the next thing we've got there is, so this is number five now, everyone deals with change at a different rate or pace. So again, the poll opened up to you guys. Everyone deals with change at a different rate or at a different pace. Everyone deals with change at a different rate or pace. Depending on whether you guys think that this is a myth or whether you guys think that this is a truth. Does everyone deal with change at a different rate or at a different pace? Okay, so I can see a few more people coming back through. Okay, and yes, this is a truth. I can see a very strong result here. We actually have 0% in our myth. And we've got, just to push the results out to you guys, and a 72% for truth. What we have saying here is that everybody does do it at a different rate. Some people change really quickly and some people don't, not as quickly. And what we've got here is the Kubler-Ross change curve. Some of you would have seen this change curve before. And what we're saying is when we're going through change, most of us will go through the cycle exactly the same way. This is the change curve, and the Kubler-Ross change curve says there are stages to change. And every type of change that we do, we will always be going through these stages. And we all go through the stages. You can't say to me, Louisa, actually, I always skip shock. I'm always skipping denial. I'm never in denial. The reality is you actually go through all of the, even if it's only a wobble, a quick minute second of a wobble, Okay, through to a big roller coaster. It depends on how long you stay in a certain stage. So the seven stages of our Kubler-Ross change curve starts with shock. So let's take, for example, organizations often have announcements where they're saying, we're going to restructure the organization. And the biggest one that these days that happens is people are given redundancies. And the first stage you're going to go through when you get that news is you're going to go through shock. 
And in that instance, you're going to actually then go, it's, it's denial, it can't be me. Did they really say me? Even if it's only for a split second, you go through the shock, through to denial, before you get into a phase of where they call anger and blame. And in anger and blame, what happens here is you actually do outward anger, outward blaming. And here is where you usually blame the organization. You blame the company, you blame your managers, you blame the top management for not looking after you, you blame the organization for always trying to cut costs but they're spending money in the wrong ways, you blame that the organization is not looking after its staff well, so it's all outward anger. You're just angry outwardly. Then there is the stage called bargaining and self-blame, which is what happens here is you do inward anger. So you start to blame yourself. You start to then go, you know what? Maybe they made me redundant because I wasn't working hard enough. Maybe it is my fault. Maybe I didn't actually help anything to do with my team. Maybe I wasn't contributing to the organization. So you then have a little bit of inward anger. Maybe I should have tried harder. Was it my fault? And then we go into a stage of where we call depression and confusion. This is the lowest point of our change curve. This is where we go into a depression and confusion stage. And this is where, for a change manager, this is the stage of the curve that we will need to provide the most support to. Change managers need to often understand that as we or humans, we will all go through this change curve and every change that you are actually enforcing or implying in your organization, people will always go through depression and confusion. This is where you want to have the support groups, the right messages, the communications that is set in place, the training, to help them move from that into acceptance, that they can accept that your change has happened. And then to your last stage being problem solving, you'll see at the bottom axis, the golden key element to dealing with all of these stages is time. The longer time you provide to somebody, the more likely they're being able to get through this whole change curve. Where many organizations go wrong, for change managers in particular, is that they bring on the change manager too late as the pieces of the puzzle. So right at the end, they might say, you know what, we are going to be implementing change, now we bring on the change manager. All they want at that point in time is to get the change manager to actually communicate the change. We are saying here, no, you need as much time as possible. So if you know you're starting a project, then you should already be considering bringing on a change manager to help you with getting people through the journey of change, getting them through this change curve. Because as much time as possible is the best way to deal with change. We all have a different uh, minute calculation to this change. Some people are a lot faster than the others. Some people will go through this change curve much quicker than the others. Some people might still oscillate between stages. What I mean by this is you could stay between stage three and stage four. You could get angry at yourself, angry at others, angry at yourself, angry at others, and bounce between stages and actually not move further. So this is where the role of the change manager is very important to ensure that you're moving people through the change curve and you're helping them through that. Time is the ultimate key factor here when it comes to handling change. The next statement we've got for number six is there is no way, there is no way to deal with bias. Just got to let it happen as it naturally happens. So there's no way to deal with bias. There's a lot of different types of bias. So it naturally happens. There's no way to deal with it. You just got to let it happen. So there's no way to deal with the fact that we as humans, we naturally have biases. So you just got to let it happen. There is no way to deal with bias. You just got to let it happen. Okay, I'm just going to close that poll now. There is no way to deal with bias. Just got to let it be as it happens naturally. So yes, we naturally are biased. So because of that, as a change manager, do you just let it be? Because of the fact that we know humans naturally have different biases. Okay, and pushing out the results to you guys. This is a 60% saying that this is a myth, with a 5% of you guys saying that this is a truth. This is, in fact, a myth. Okay, and I'm only dealing with the four common four cognitive biases here today, and I'm going to show you guys how you can overcome that problem. So, that first cognitive bias we've got there is called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when people constantly have this bias. They've got a particular bias, natural bias. We all have these bias. And they're looking for things that is always going to confirm their bias. I will be honest with you all. I'm probably the biggest um, non-exercising person in this whole entire world. I don't like exercising. And I have this huge bias for exercise. And what I often do is I would actually listen out 
and I'll get confirmation that exercising is actually more damage than good. So every time that a colleague comes into work and they've gone for a hockey game and they've injured themselves, that to me is confirmation bias. It confirms my bias of the fact that exercising does more injury than good. So if the next person comes to me and says they've pulled their back again from exercising, that confirms my bias. So I have bias in saying that exercising is not good for you. So I would then be on the listen out for every single time someone confirms my bias, that's my confirmation bias. And what we want to do here as a change manager, the way you would approach this is, what we say is you want to communicate reasons for change, why are you actually changing? So you actually have to move them away from that confirmation. Why do I have to exercise? You need to give me some valid reasons and it has to be so objective evidence to back this up. You need to give me a lot of evidence as to why exercise is actually good for me versus me thinking, no, 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 it actually does more damage than good. So the next one then says it includes losses and problems that will be avoided by changing. So if I don't change, what's going to happen to me? I might blow up into a big balloon, okay? I might get a lot of all these diseases, all these health issues, illnesses. You're going to start listing them more to me. And as I get older, back pain, problems, uh, high cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera, then you're going to say, Louisa, you need to start exercising. These are the reasons. Give me the evidence. Then you've got to be repeatedly communicate a compelling vision. So you've got to constantly be giving that same information and that positive reinforcement of why I should exercise. And the last part, which is to touch your hearts and minds. So giving me a story, a compelling story. And often what compelling stories I hear is I hear people that says people actually because they weren't exercising, they weren't healthy, they got diabetes, and diabetes led them to this, led them to another stage in their life, and it leads to all these other issues. And yes, it then touches my heart and mind when I see people who are unable to do things in their life anymore because of the fact that they didn't exercise. So you have to put that compelling reason and force in front of them, constantly repeat that information as well to move them away from that confirmation bias. The next one there, there is a status quo bias. This is back to like my grandparents who don't want to move to online banking. They have a status quo bias. They're biased that it is better by far to go into a tel uh, to go into a bank, see a teller, get their little passport stamped because they say that status quo bias. They're living in their little status quo. So they're still comfort zones. And humans often will always work in your comfort zone. So what they're saying here is to approach that is you want to ensure communication messages includes what will continue. So in other words, you have to give them the what's not changing. It's just important for my grandparents to know that you're still with that same bank. That is not changing. So none of the fees, none of them are changing. So the things that are not changing is just as important for the people who need that status quo bias. They need to know what's not changing. Because so often we focus on too much on the change and we forget about actually there's a lot of things that's not changing. This is only one small component of what is changing. So you have to give them the what's not changing, what's going to remain the same. You want to then give them practical steps, steps to help them get to how to move away from their status quo. It needs to be comfortable enough, just a little bit like that Beckett and Harris formula. It needs to have that desirability and the practicality of that change. So you have to be able to show them that if you want them to move away from their status quo bias. The next one there's availability bias. This is probably one of the ones we get a lot more from the media these days. It is where there is information readily available at the forefront of your mind. And often this one for organizations is usually what's happened in the past. You remember certain things and that becomes your availability bias because you're constantly remembering that first. That's what's available. It is information that is readily available to your mind. So for example, I've been recently doing a lot of travel, and as I'm traveling, every airplane, airport wants to check on whether you've got a Samsung S7 Galaxy Note, okay, because the last news that I heard about them was that their um, iPad, uh, sorry, their tablets blew up, okay, their battery pack blew up, and so that's my availability bias. Even though the reality is it actually happens to iPads, it happens to all the other brands, but it's what's available to me right now. And so therefore my bias is when I'm going out there to purchase my next tablet, my first instant thought of my Samsung is, Samsung, mm, that means it's going to blow up. 
okay? Because it's availability bias, even though that's not the case for every Samsung product, but it is availability bias because that's the last thing that I've got on my mind or that is what's readily available. So this is why many organizations spend a lot on a media team that will be looking at to, if there's bad media, to remove that. Why? Because that's availability bias. The first thing you're going to consider is what's readily available, what you've got readily at hand, what you can actually get access to. No different to organizations that's tried a project in the past, and people can remember that project. So historicals becomes that availability bias. They remember that, that it didn't work so well last time, so it's not going to work so well this time. So what you want to do here is you want to give those specific reasons that was raised, those issues. So Samsung's dealing with it by those issues that you have raised. This is what we're doing. Okay, and this is how we're improving it. This is how it will never happen again. So you want to then share the better stories, the better case studies. So Samsung will then put in new, new products out with the new scenarios and new case studies and all the new stories as to why it's a good product still. And then they need to constantly make it visible and accessible to the other information so that the bad information that you've got readily available is also just as easily reachable with the good information. So you want them to be able to get to both the good and the bad so that eventually the good overtakes the bad and your availability bias becomes only just the good stuff. That's no different to people who like a certain brand. You might often like a certain brand and that's availability bias. You've only got the good stuff because that media, that marketing that is given to you is always portraying that it's the good things and you can only think of the good instances. So every time that someone talks to me about the brand that they like, they can only tell me the good stuff because of the fact that their availability bias only hits what's readily available to them. So again, you, as a change manager, we need to consider how do I put the success stories? How do I put the things that have working this time? Yes, last time it didn't work and we acknowledge that. So do not sweep it under the carpet. Acknowledge it. How are we dealing with it this time? How are we improving from that? And then as it actually works and the success stories you've got, share that. The last one there you've got is your bandwagon effect for your cognitive device. This is where it becomes more groupthink. Everybody starts to go on this bandwagon because I heard that person say and that person say and everybody starts doing it. So you want to commute. This could be actually positive or negative. So everybody can get on a positive bandwagon or a negative bandwagon. So depending on which way you go. So you, again, you want to be sharing those success stories as early as possible. That's just dealing with cognitive biases. So yes, there is different ways to deal with cognitive biases and you and they are the top four ones I've just done, but there are a lot more out there. So here we're talking about the next statement. There are different motivators for an individual to want to change. There are different motivators for individuals to want to change. So again, I'll give you guys a few seconds. There are different motivators for an individual to want to change. And we've got coming through, there are different motivators for an individual to want to change. You can see a very strong one here of responses coming through. So there are different motivators for an individual to want to change. And here you guys have said that we've got 0%, zero again another 0% for myth, with a 70% of you saying that this is the truth, this is your strong 70% of you, you are all correct in that sense, this is a truth. There are different motivators. One of the ones that change managers often use is the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Some of you would have known this already and seen this. Maslow hierarchy of needs is actually a very good one to be able to help you go through and look at what motivates people and where are their motivations at. So this hierarchy is, as a hierarchy is, built on each stage. So we start at the very bottom, physiological needs. As a human, the most basic needs we have in life is that we need to have someone to sleep, we need some water, we need some food, and we need shelter. That's our physiological needs. We've got that's the most basic needs in life. As we build that up, that's our safety needs. This is our routine. This is knowing that tomorrow we're still going to be able to get on a bus, get on a train, and get to work. And this is what we're doing, and this is how we're going to drop off our kids, and that we're not going to have a World War Three tomorrow. We know that there is going to be order in place, that people are still going to queue up for the bus, for the train. They're still going to be able to open a door and line up in certain ways, that they're your everything's still predictable okay, and it still has that routine that you're expecting. So that's your safety needs. 
Moving on to that is your love needs. Love needs is about your sense of belonging. So it's about in all aspects. So it's in your personal life, so your family, your um, family and friends, and then also in your work life. So having your colleagues, okay, so acceptance with your colleagues as well. These days there is a new type which is also including social, so also social, so some people actually feel the need by, by how many friends they've got on their Facebook accounts. So you've got different levels of needs for your love, but it's about all levels of belonging. It's your sense of belonging in your different groups. Okay. And as you build on that, you've then got your esteem needs. This is your personal achievement, your personal recognition, how much you get for your own. So this is your self-esteem kind of in that way, where you're going to get people that says to you, yep, Louisa, you've done a great job. This is that need to be recognized, that need to be actually achieving. And at the tippy point is be the best that you can, which is called self-actualization. So what happens here when it comes to motivation levels is it depends on the change that you're providing. Is your change only impacting the tippy point? Are you breaking down the pyramid completely or are you only breaking down a certain level? So what happens is if you are doing a change which is reorganizing an organization and you might be giving people redundancies, what happens here with certain people's redundancies is it might actually impact their physiological needs. You are stopping someone from getting paid anymore and they're the breadwinner to a family of three and they need the home loan and they can't repay the home loan. So they're going to be having, they're going to be out of where they should be still sleeping the next day, their food, their shelter, their water, their most basic needs in life. When you crash that pyramid at the very bottom level, everything above it would also come collapsing down. It is built off each level. So what we're trying to say here is depending on the change that you are impacting, which level of the pyramid are you? Are you just impacting the steam needs? Is it, are you going to change someone's job role so that their recognition is going to be a bit different? But everything else is exactly the same. So their love needs are still going to be the same, their safety needs are still going to be the same, their physiological needs are still the same, but their esteem needs might change. So the pyramid doesn't actually collapse that much. So in that sense, that they're not going to have as much instant barriers with you. Understand that people are going to have barriers and resistance because of the fact that you are either going down to the lowest level of the pyramid or to a more top level of the pyramid. Are they losing everything or are they still having a lot of it and they're only impacting at the top point? So again, you need to see what motivates them to change. Do they need to rebuild the whole pyramid or is their pyramid already quite sustained? This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There are many other ways to assess the motivations. So in the same box, they talk about all of these different types of ways to actually see what motivates people to actually do change. Then the eighth one we've got there today is you, you communicate, you send comms, only when you know all the information. So you're only going to send comms when you know everything. Okay, so you communicate, send comms, only when you know all the information. Is this truth or is this a myth? Do you think this is a truth or a myth? You communicate, send comms, only when you know all the information. So you communicate and send comms only when you know all the information. So again, I'll just collect some of your results now. You communicate, send comms, only when you know all the information. Okay, so you communicate, send comms, only when you know all the information. I can still see a few more coming through. Just pushing out the results to you guys. Here we've got 59% of you said this is a myth, with a 5% of you saying that this is a truth, and some of you not too sure. This is in fact a myth. Okay. There are what we call six factors to encourage engagement. Okay, and this is according to the Simbok. What would we actually say are the factors that encourage engagement? The first factor is the one that we're talking about here is you don't wait until full information is available. So it's really important for you to be able to say, hey guys, change is coming. Okay. If you don't know everything then, that's fine. You don't have to communicate exactly what the change is, but allow people to know that there is change coming. The worst you could do, which most organizations do, is bring change onto people like, hey, surprise, and think that we're all mushrooms that's going to pop up out of the dark. A lot of organizations do a lot of things in the background, 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 and all of a sudden one day, 
bang, they announce it out to you. And that's when we don't handle that change very well. Because what we've been talking about so far is that you need a lot of time to be able to go on the change curve. You need to be able to get through the stages. So if you need to be able to get through the time and have a lot of time, you should communicate that, hey, yes, we're doing some things in the background. We're not too sure what all it all means right now, but the change is coming. So you have to be able to tell people that some information, yep, Changes company, it's happening. Even at the beginning of a project that you're about to do, this project is coming. Project brings on change. Every project you're about to do, consider some sort of comms. Next uh, factor to encourage engagement. Next factor says that we should focus on two-way as much face-to-face -face interaction. Okay, you might tell me, Louisa, though, but we can't actually all co-locate these days. We don't actually have that luxury because we work for a multinational organization or we're even just across different states. Yes, but we've got technology these days, such as me right now. You can see me and if we chose to, we could see you. You want to have as much face-to-face -face interactions. Why? Because when we communicate, a lot of it is actually your body language and your tone and how it comes across rather than just the words. Our most common form of communication these days is actually email. But the highest miscommunication form of is also email, and yet we still do a lot of it. So what we want to do is try and minimize that much misinterpretation and confusion and try to go to as much two-way communication as possible. The next uh, factor that we should consider is that it should be about the impact to individuals. You will be impacting change to individuals on a different level. Some people more, some people less. You're looking back again, just like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Some people you're impacting at the tippy point of the pyramid. So you're not breaking that many levels apart. But other people you might be targeting the very lowest point of the Maslow hierarchy. So you're breaking apart the whole entire pyramid. So you need to consider what is the impact of your change that you are going to be implementing. And at what level of engagement do you actually need to do with those people to support them? So that in the change curve, they don't stay in depression and confusion. How do we help them move to acceptance? The next one there is target audiences to segment information and avoid overload. So it's very important for us to then go, well, these people have certain impacts. They should only get certain comms. Not everybody needs the same amount of comms. What we often do in many organizations is we think it's one size fit all and it's not. Do not think that you're just going to do a mass communication, one email out to the whole organization, go kick, that was comms done. That is not what communication is about. Target your audience, segment the information, give them the relevant pieces that is needed. And what they're saying here is at the same time, don't overload people. When you start to get too much, people will stop reading it and then you're not going to be able to get your comms out there. You want to, the golden thing we were talking about, allow plenty of time. Allow as much time as you can possibly give it from the beginning of your project or from when your organization knows you're about to deal with some sort of change. Deal with it in a way where you're going to send some comms out from as early as possible. And the last one is encourage feedback. So when you're asking for feedback and you're going to, the last part they said there is act on it. The worst thing you could do is ask people for feedback and not do anything. And when you do that, people will stop giving you feedback. So as a change manager, you need to consider you've got to make sure, yes, I need to get feedback. I want to hear from people, is this working for them? Are they getting everything that they need? And then at that point, act on it. Don't just collate everything and don't do anything and respond to people. If they don't get the information, they'll never give you feedback again. Hey, those are some of the things that came out of the change management certification. This is a certification out of a big change management handbook. As you can see in front of me, this is the change management handbook. This is from change management certification. It is aligned to the CMI. The CMI has worked with APMG to put this certification together, of which it is a one week, you could do it over one week with us here at DDLS. It is three days for foundations and two days for practitioner. And over a week, you'll be able to learn some of those practices, or things that is in the change management body of knowledge. When you are practitioner certified with us here at DDLS on change management, you will also be certified at a foundation level with the CMI, with the Change Management Institute, because it is recognized with the Change Management Institute. This is internationally recognized. It is based on the body of knowledge, so it is based on what industry industry's best practices. This is what everybody's saying should happen with change. How would you find out more information about that change management certification? If you go to our website on www.ddls.com.au,
for you. You'll see courses, process and change management. Then you'll see where our foundation as well as our practitioner is. We are located are around seven different branches across Australia, of which I can say if you can't get to one of our branches physically, we do now offer DDLS Anywhere. And this is, you can find that information on our website. DDLS Anywhere allows you to be able to sit on any of our courses on any of the dates through technology such as this, where you are able to get into the classrooms virtually. So the idea is you could attend any of our change management certification courses from anywhere around Australia if you want to. So this is the third one of our myth busting sessions, of which we've got one last myth busting session to go next month. This is on the myth busting on the role of the project manager. That's going to be next month in June. We're going to be myth busting on the role of the project manager. If you have attended all four seminars, don't forget that you will get the myth bust code so you can get a $300 voucher of us to do any of our certifications with us today. So, any questions? Fantastic. Thank you, Louisa. We will now go through the audience questions. Please type your question into the chat panel and we will address them accordingly. I believe we've already got one question. I can see a few, yes. Yep. <laughs> um, we've got one from Chakinda. You covered the distinction between PM and CM roles. What about CM and BA? What are the key ways that change managers should, shouldn't work with the BA on projects in order to optimize the success of the change implementation? Yes. The BA role is pretty much again, so we would have done a session on the business analyst and with the business analyst was the responsibilities of how the BA looks after the requirements, the scope, they have to listen to and be that management between um, what you're doing as well as, so it could be the middleman between where the project is and the business itself. And what we're saying here is if you're going to wear that hat, if you're going to wear the hat as a change manager as well, you need to then take off your hat of the, of that requirements. You need to take off the, what the scope is about and you're just focusing on what, how to deal with the change. How do we actually deal with the change readiness? How do we deal with the change transition? So it's always just focusing on the change components. And it's also, it does get compared in the book as well with the business analyst. So again, that's another big table too there. And I'm happy to share that with you as well after this. Great. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, we've got another question from Brad. Um, time seems to be key to change. So what happens when we aren't given a lot of time? This is a common problem. I will actually say is that project manager might say to you, hey, change manager, you've got three weeks to do all of the change. And that's not much time sometimes to do all the comms and rectify all that. Uh, unfortunately, it sometimes is a constraint of organizations when you don't have that much time. But it's also an education process. It's about educating for the next projects, but future projects, about educating for how you handle it better the next time around to say to them, you know what, we're not going to deal with that if you're not going to give us more time earlier, if you're not going to actually then factor in change as part of the beginning of the project. So perhaps you might need to talk to your PMO when they bring on new projects, they have to also consider bringing on the change manager upfront. So how do we actually change some of the ways of your processes in your organizations to include some of those works. Okay, great. Thanks, Louisa. Uh, we've got a question from Bindu. How does change management work in an agile environment? So you can take it in various ways, depending on the type of agile you do. So that's a really good question. There's different types of agiles. If you are an agile organization that goes live, let's say every two, two weeks, and that means you are asking your business to be also changing every two weeks, you either need to have a change team in your organization. That's why there's now CMOs, a lot of CMOs, change management office, that deals with that change on an ongoing basis every two weeks. They're actually handling the comms every two weeks. They're handling the training every two weeks. They're handling how people are going through it, how they're getting all the information every two weeks. But again, you have to actually include that as part of the responsibilities of your definition of done, of your go live, of your deployment. As you're deploying, these things all still need to be considered. Okay, perfect. And we've got a question from Emily. I've previously heard of Pros Prosky, yet there was no mention of it today. What is the difference or is it the same? Okay, so 
ProSci is uh, one framework that is out there for change. Uh, it is one that is a proprietary. In other words, it was created up with the company and ProSci is just one particular framework. Uh, if your organization uses ProSci, by all means, you could go learn what that ProSci framework looks like. What this is, is this is the change management body of knowledge. So it is just industry best practices. It isn't a framework in particular that says, um, this is how the template should look like and this is what you should do at the beginning, which is what you should do at the end. That's what a framework will be. That's a framework. This is a body of knowledge that gives you the guidance. Okay. Okay. And then we have one more question from David. The last myth you just said you don't wait until full information to communicate, but wouldn't communicating any earlier just confuse the audience? It, it's a fine line between communicating um, wrong information and just communicating early. You need to communicate early in the sense, hey, change is coming, but you don't need to make up information if you don't know it at that point. We're not asking you just because you need to communicate early to make stuff up or tell them the wrong information. If you don't know it, you don't know it, so don't try and confuse people. Tell them what you do know at that point in time. It's good enough for people to know, okay, they're still working on it. It's coming. There's an update. So it's important for you to share as much as you can and just share so that people know it's coming so they've got more time to deal with.